It's said that Kevin Bacon is separated from all other actors by only six degrees. While that's not, strictly speaking, true, it might be interesting to explore the interconnectedness of the film industry. At any rate, it's probably a good jumping-off point for a movie-reviewed YouTube channel. With that in mind, welcome to the Six Degrees Movie Review Marathon. Before we start, a note about the rules. Each film must share one actor or actress with a previous film in the series. Film franchises are excluded from the potential choices, because each of those might have its own video series in the future. For my purposes, a franchise will be defined as a trilogy or longer set of connected movies. Sequels will be allowed in this series, though they can't be viewed consecutively. The goal of this marathon is to create as long a chain of films as possible without using the same connection twice. Shall we begin? I originally planned to start the marathon with a Kevin Bacon movie, but that probably isn't the smartest move. A heavily connected actor at the very beginning seems like a mistake. Perhaps a smaller movie with a smaller footprint. A few spring to mind, All is Lost, Castaway, Gravity, but those all have the same problem, and none of them are particularly recent either. Luckily, there's a suitable mainstream sci-fi film released right in 2023 called 65. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, Kylo Ren was on deportation duty and crash-landed into The Last of Us with dinosaurs. 65 presents an emotionally tormented space pilot named Mills, who crash-lands his transport ship on an uncharted planet after an unexpected meteor storm. In the wreckage, he finds a single survivor, a young girl named Koa, and decides to lead her safely off the planet, a task that proves more arduous than anticipated. Working against a language barrier, Mills guides Koa through the prehistoric wilderness, wrestling with predatory dinosaurs, grappling with perilous terrain, and racing against an impending extinction-level meteor strike. And in the process, they just might rediscover the family they lost along the way. The story of 65 is a bit of a mess. The premise is interesting, but most Twilight Zone episodes were. It could have benefited from a bit more thought about how to execute that premise. They seem to take a throw-everything-at-the-wall kind of approach. The concept kind of diluted any grounding the story might have had, which is fine if that's the movie you want to make, but this wasn't trying to be Starship Troopers. For the sake of willing suspension of disbelief, I'll ignore the astronomical coincidence that an alien species identical to humans evolved elsewhere in the universe, that they independently developed our exact mathematical units, discovered long-range space travel, and randomly stumbled on a perfectly inhabitable planet just as they were crash-landing, but also within days of that planet suffering a massive catastrophic interstellar event. Oh, and that they're immune to all the diseases to which we're currently immune, because one of the only stories this film isn't copying is War of the Worlds. But that still leaves the fact that Mills is on a two-year mission, and Earth is four light-years away from our nearest non-Sun star, not accounting for the rate of expansion of the universe, and they clearly weren't traveling at the speed of light. Maybe years are longer on their planet, but why should we assume that when they also use kilometers? Really, distances don't seem to matter throughout the story. Communications across space are instant, the characters can travel great distances extremely fast when the story requires it, and the rendezvous with the rescue team is pretty quick. Also, their escape pod is only 15 kilometers away, so why do they travel through so many biomes? On their two-day trek, they visit a swamp, some forests, grasslands, tar pits inside a forest for some reason, a system of cave tunnels on flat land, a mountain that kind of disappears when it's no longer needed, and a lake that definitely disappears. There are also two separate geyser fields, with convenient water that doesn't splash, and chooses when and how severely it wants to boil based on the needs of the plot. A lot of the plot is generated by conveniences and inconveniences afforded by the available technology. For example, Mills has a rifle with infinite ammunition, until it malfunctions, or suddenly doesn't, which can also one-shot a T-Rex, sometimes. He also has a canteen that detects if foods are safe, and literal dinosaur sensors, which somehow miss a random parasitic worm, but also can be broken in such a way that they explode that same parasite on contact. The worst offender, though, is the handheld GPS tracker, which loses its dedicated GPS signal randomly, but can easily calculate the movement of asteroids in space, detect dinosaurs in the dark with no sensors of its own, and turn both home movies and real-time events from its vicinity into holograms that it can project from any distance. It's such a great machine, in fact, that it tells him everything he needs to know, but somehow doesn't have translation software preloaded with the language of the passengers of the ship. It clearly wasn't incorporated into the main ship either, since the autopilot didn't notice a massive asteroid field in space until it was already traveling through it. Also, why was the meteor activity unexpected when the entire area is uncharted? And why does Earth appear out of nowhere? Additionally, 
All the dinosaurs seem to be predatory, which makes absolutely no sense, especially when they also seem to hunt in packs, regardless of how large they are. They also have a weird, unnatural tendency to stalk our human characters, but they also take some convenient rests from doing it, allowing for character moments to happen. It definitely makes total sense when they appear out of thin air to start attacking. How could so many giant lizards go completely unnoticed, especially when Mills has literal dinosaur sensors? And while I'm at it, why did they even bother having Koa put poison berry juice on the bone weapon? They do fire that particular Chekhov gun, but what effect does the poison have? None. The story is derivative to say the least. It might even deserve to be in that dictionary entry. It's trying to be Jurassic Park, and Aliens, and The Descent, and Pitch Black, and The Last of Us, and heck, Star Wars, all within the general outline of an actual Twilight Zone episode. By now there are lots of examples of what Twilight Zone looks like without Rod Serling, and it's not pretty. 65 doesn't quite sink that low, but it's still not very good. The writing and story are probably a 3 out of 10. Moving on to characters, we have literally four in the entire film. Koa, Mills, and his family. His wife barely registers, not even receiving a name, so we'll start with his daughter, Naveen, who is the weakest of the three. Naveen suffers from a mystery disease, which requires an expensive treatment that Mills can only afford if he takes on a long-term mission in space. She loves her father, and misses him as she gets sicker and sicker until the end, which comes before the beginning of the story. Not much there other than half-heartedly building motivations for her father. Mills, our purported protagonist, is supposed to be tortured by his daughter's death, which I assume is supposed to build tension toward his new surrogate daughter. We don't get much of this, if anything, though. He gives up hope just after the crash, but that has more to do with being marooned on an uncharted planet, and his memories of Naveen actually keep him from giving up, inexplicably. The early strain of his relationship with Koa derives more from the language barrier and her brattiness than from a transference of grief. That said, his dedication to protecting and comforting Koa, and his proficiency in survival skills all materialize organically. Adam Driver gives a solid performance, despite not having much of a character arc. From what I can tell, the desired arc is finding a reason to live on by caring for a child who reminds him of the daughter he lost. The problem is that the characterization in the script is shallow. For example, Mills is injured in the crash, and that wound becomes infected over time. This is meant to justify his choice in the end to lead the T-Rex away from the escape pod, rather than fighting so that he can join the launch. But it doesn't really serve any purpose. It's not a hindrance to him, especially compared to the other injuries he suffers, and he never succumbs to it. It's just another of the many setups in the film that never pay off. On the other hand, Koa starts out as a scared little girl, thrust into a dangerous world she doesn't understand with a total stranger. Ariana Greenblatt plays this role wonderfully. She exhibits several subtle emotions through her countenance, which evolve over time, even without words. She also has an actual arc. She begins as a stubborn, invasive, and bratty child, acting out against Mills because she doesn't understand the danger she's in. She's then challenged with harsh realities, and grows more self-reliant and appreciative because of them. There are four main events that comprise her arc. In the first one, she finds a dinosaur stuck in a tar pit. Setting aside the oddity of a random tar pit, and a cold tar pit at that, being in the middle of the forest, this scene demonstrates her gentle nature and naivete, which is promptly crushed when the saved dinosaur is immediately killed in front of her. The second scene is when she is personally attacked. It's a traumatic moment that shows her why Mills has been forceful with her all along, and perhaps she comes to realize that she is the same as the dinosaur she had unsuccessfully saved. The third event is when she is separated from Mills by the cave collapse. She discovers that she might not be able to depend on him to save her all the time. And the fourth event is the T-Rex attack at the end, where she is, for all intents and purposes, safe, but decides to put herself in danger to help Mills. She accepts him as her family. This story arc accomplished what it set out to achieve, even if the girl boss moment at the end made no sense. I'd rate the acting and characters at a 5 out of 10. I was gonna say 4, but Koa is pretty much the only thing I've praised so far, so maybe she deserves another point. In terms of cinematography, there's some beautiful visuals in this film. The landscapes are gorgeous, as is what little we see of space. The interior of the ruined ship seemed like an homage to Alien or Pitch Black, and overall the visual effects are rather seamless. One thing I never noticed in this film is the strange green screen effect, where the lighting on the actors emphasizes the lack of depth where reality meets CGI. Not seeing where the green screen is being used is quite impressive, especially given how bad it is in much higher budget movies these days. That said, I'm not sure the film accomplished everything it wanted. Several attempts at horror elements fell flat, from the trash compactor dino jaws, to the crag climbing velociraptor jump scare, to Jurassic Park's stormy T-Rex reveal. Maybe I'm just desensitized to this stuff, but I never felt that they were creatively trying to scare the audience. 
Actually, it seemed like more of an obligation to add these things, when they really wanted to focus on the Last of Us storyline. This is also true of the action scenes. The dinosaurs always attack in ones, and they often sidle up to our heroes, telegraphing their pounce to give time for the character to be saved in the nick of time. None of this is groundbreaking, but the sound, music, and visuals come together pretty well. I'd say 6 out of 10 on this. 65 has too many problems to be considered a good movie, but how enjoyable did I find it? The performances were pretty good, which helped me invest somewhat in the characters. This is fortunate, since the parts of the movie that worked were often the character moments, especially Koa's part in them. Perhaps more importantly, Koa is relatable and not insufferable. It can be challenging to create a balanced child character, because they often react differently than adults. This movie actually nailed it with her. You can pinpoint the exact moment when she decides Mills is a jerk and she's going to act out against him, as well as the exact moment she realizes he's not so bad and she should stop. A lot of this is down to Ariana Greenblatt's performance, if I'm honest, which was the highlight of the film for me. Everything else about this film that's adequate seems taken from other superior films. This movie is inoffensive, but not memorable. It doesn't inspire any conversation. There's nothing outstanding that inspires great praise or recommendation, but it's not terrible, so it's neither infuriating nor fodder for ridicule. Actually, I needed to watch the movie three times to complete this review, which is strange because I usually remember things pretty well. I'm one of those people who, when Arya met Angai in Storm of Swords, still remembered he had won the hands tourney archery competition in A Game of Thrones. Anyway, if you want exciting dinosaur or space movies, look elsewhere. But I enjoyed the development of the paternal relationship. For enjoyment, maybe a 4 out of 10? Combining the scores from all four sections, we're left with a solid 4 out of 10 movie. It was an interesting enough concept to draw me into the theater, but I probably wouldn't tell other people to do so. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you think in the comments section. Am I being too harsh? Or too nice? If you liked this video, I would appreciate it if you clicked the little buttons below and consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks again, and I hope to see you when the marathon continues.